hopefully get going. All right. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to our second to last viticulture webinar for um, our winter. It's not really winter anymore, but our winter season. We're going to be focusing on food safety and produce safety updates, some of the new information you need to know about the regulation. Not so much changes, but shifts. And just kind of give you a chance to ask questions and figure out where you need to go from here. And not, it's not as daunting as you actually might have been led to believe. So I'm just throwing this up here really quickly so that everybody knows and you see us as an equal opportunity access institution. This is required of us by our USDA and INFA funding. And I want to make sure that we don't lose all that money. So, so just a little bit of etiquette for Zoom. I love it if you guys can turn on your cameras just so it doesn't feel like we're talking into the void or on radio, but if you don't, that's fine. I completely understand not having the internet bandwidth to do it. Just makes us happy to see your smiling faces. Please do keep your mics off. Everyone currently is, and I really appreciate that. At the end of the session, we will have a chance to ask questions, and that would be a great time to turn on your mic and ask your question. I do ask that if you do want to speak, please turn on your camera just so we can kind of see who is speaking, and it doesn't just lead to a jumble of voices over top of each other. Questions can be added to the chat box. That is something that's located in your little participant bar at the very bottom. I have been dropping messages into it over the course of us just kind of getting ready. You can add questions there the entire time or at the end, if you don't wanna turn on your mic, it's really quite up to you. But this gives you a chance to add something there and we can get to it during the talk when it might be most relevant or we can wait. And that way you don't have to keep it in your head and then try to remember to ask it at the very end. It's just a nice way to jot things down. All right. So this is our today's speaker, Sarah Mutnick. She is the Produce Safety Rule Coordinator and she is actually the one who you would be interfacing with the most when it comes to these different types of rules. She works for the Colorado Department of Agriculture and she is she is a Colorado native and is from Westminster, Colorado. She did go to University of Colorado Boulder, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. We still love her. And she's been working at this position for about a year and a half, but she's been with CDA for about four and a half years. So she does kind of know a little bit more of the inner workings of the department. And it's probably for our benefit that she does. And her main responsibilities are being part of the education outreach component of the produce safety program. Um, so this is basically a lot of the actual Produce Safety Alliance grower training, so something that you'll learn a little bit more about today, the on-farm readiness reviews, and the registries and in, um, inventories. So she would definitely be the one you would contact the most if you have any questions or concerns. Her contact information is provided here on this slide, and I will probably add that to our chat box towards the end of this actual talk. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Perfect, thank you, Charlotte, for that introduction. So like she said, I'm Sarah Music, Produce Safety Coordinator. So I'm gonna just jump right into this. Ooh. Okay, so for the produce safety rule with everything else, there's covered and non-covered produce. Um, the non-covered produce is a non is an exhaustive list of certain certain produce that isn't covered under the rule. Um, if you would like to know that list, I can send it to you. But anything that isn't on that list is covered by the rule. So that's why wine grapes and table grapes are included under the produce safety rule, and why they are considered covered produce. So just to kind of give you a line of why wine grapes, why I'm reaching out, it's because they are technically a covered crop under the rule. So with any rule, I'm sure everyone is aware there's always exemptions, right? Exceptions to those rule. So the big one um, is with produce safety is the first hurdle is a sales threshold. So the first one is, is your three-year rolling average for all your produce sales for 2019, 2020, and 2021. If you are below that number, so 29,245, you would be considered micro-exempt. 
what that means is you don't have to be in compliance with the rule. You don't have to register with us. You don't have to keep records. You can't. You don't have to do anything. Um, we just strongly encourage you to, so that way it's not a huge jump when you do have to become compliant. But that's just that's up to you. That's up to your discretion. Um, qualified exempt is another exemption. I won't get into that one. I know most of you, if you would like to know what that one is, I can let you know. And then the big one that I know for wine grapes is the commercially exempt, um, especially if your wine grapes are going, either you're making the wine or you're sending it to a winery, it's going through a kill step. FDA does know that the wine making process is enough of a kill step and they view that as, as enough to kill off pathogens. So you would be compliant under the rule, but commercially exempt. I'll kind of go a little bit more into this in a, in a couple more slides, but it has to be all your produce. So if you do wine grapes and peaches, but only the wine grapes go through a kill step, you can't be commercially exempt. Now, does that mean that we're gonna be going into your vineyards or anything? No, uh, we would just be inspecting just the peaches and because wine grapes, hops and almonds are discretionary, um, as of right now, could that change? Yes, but this is just an overall what you are kind of looking at as far as ex exemptions go. So you're probably wondering, well, why are you reaching out now? I mean, this rule, it has been in effect since 2015. Why now, right? So it is in the main framework of things, it's pretty new. Um, so our focus was more on the covered farms that are growing fully under the rule. So those covered farms um, for our inventory. So inspections actually for large farms didn't start until 2019, but all farms are now having to be fully compliant ever since 2020. So we are still going through initial inspections of covered farms. So it just hasn't been a huge priority for us to reach out to commercially exempt just because we've been focusing on our FDA obligations for inspections. So that's why you're kind of kind of seeing me now kind of reaching out, right? And so, and we also didn't have the staff. Um, most of the staff left in 2019. And so it just been one person running this program until like Charlotte had said about a year and a half ago when I joined. So there's just now two of us and we're just starting to really go into the education and outreach for commercially exempt, so the winemaking, right? So, and we are also noticing, especially with the very small farms, that there's a lot of crossover. So a lot of our peach growers, apricots, cherries tend to also be doing wine grapes as well. So we're just noticing this trend and just wanting to get ahead of it. So registration, I know many of you have maybe gotten uh, Doug Kasky's newsletter. So this program is actually under state authority and has been since 2019. Um, so now our inspectors don't have to be federally, they don't have to have FDA credentials anymore. So it's just all under state authority. It's state inspectors, all of that, which is really nice. But what came with that was a requirement to register. And the registration isn't just for covered farms, it's also for qualified exempt and then also commercially exempt. There is a question that we ask during that registration, do you, does all your produce go through a kill step, you know, to prevent pathogens from, you know, for humans? Um, and then if you click yes, that just indicates to us you're commercially exempt and then that's all you have to do. So there is a registration requirement that goes along with this rule. It's a very simple 10 minute survey, um, especially if you just grow wine grapes, that's all you'd be selecting. And then just a few more like basic contact info. So that way we can reach out to you if we ever need to. Um, so that's what that is. So then now records. So if you are commercially exempt, what does that mean for you? That just means you are commercially exempt from an inspection. So that means you still have to be compliant with the rule. So that's why you hear 
have been hearing about the PSA grower training and the registration process because a commercially exempt farm still needs to be compliant with the rule, but it's the inspection part that you're exempt from. What does that mean? That means you would have to have records. You would have to show records showing that your wine grapes and all of your wine grapes are going through a kill step. So I don't like using legalese, but these bullet points are the legal jargon that needs to be on these written records. So it needs to have a yearly written assurance of that your wine grapes are following the procedures that adequately reduce the, the possibility of microorganisms of public health significance going, you know, going through that kill step. So if you are a winery that's buying grapes to make wine, you will have to provide these assurances to those that you're buying from. For those that are selling their grapes to a winery that's making them into wine, you would have to get that from the person who's making it. And it has to be a yearly one. So you would have to keep, and you have to keep it for two years. So an inspection would be, if you were to have one, would be a records one. It'd be a records check to make sure you're commercially exempt. So, and you need to show that it's all your produce. Now, what does that mean for an inspection? What would that look like, right? So here's my next one. So wine grapes, as it stands right now, are under discretionary enforcement. That just means that we will not be going into your vineyards. Just as of right now, that's, that's where it kind of stands. Um, now. If you do grow other covered commodities, those will be inspected. So what that inspection would look like, again, you would have to go through the PSA grower training. That is a requirement under the rule. And um, there's records that you would have to keep. Uh, the inspector would wanna see harvesting activities. Um, this is just, again, this is super high level. I'm not trying to overwhelm you at all, but that's what an inspection would look like. Now, if you had said, I'm commercially exempt when an inspector were to reach out to you, then it would just be a records inspection. They would wanna see those written yearly assurances that your wine grapes, so all your produce is going through a kill step. If you can show that, then that's where the inspection ends. If you cannot, if you cannot produce those records, then they would do a full inspection which means they'd have to see harvesting activities. If you have a pack house, any of that, that would be something that they would have to do. So that's all I got. It's very high level. I just, I didn't want to overwhelm anyone, but this is just super high level, what it means for wine grapes under the produce safety rule. Obviously, I know Charlotte had said that she put out my contact information, but here it is again. Doesn't hurt to have it in multiple locations. If you know, we do understand that all farms are different. So they're all unique. I've been on, you know, so many different farms that grow the same commodities and I find different things. So if you wanna talk specifically about your farm and what it would mean for you, I'd be more than happy to do that. I can give you other resources as well. So that is my, um, my phone line and then also my email address. So feel free to reach out, but otherwise, if you have any questions, I will take them. So we do have one question in the, um, well, actually we have a couple questions in the chat box and I'll just read them to you. What counts as an assurance from the winery? Would a memo on a way tag count? Yeah, so long as it says those words that I had shown, like it, it goes through a process that adequately reduces the microorganisms of you know, human health significance, it doesn't matter what the record is. Now, if you would like to have, I know we have like record templates that I could send, but um, you don't, so long as it has those words somewhere on a record, on a piece of paper that you can show an inspector, that's just fine. Actually, I would love to have a copy of that template and we can send it out to this entire group because I definitely am going to forget those those words. So a, a tax, yes. like a, just a template that we can figure out is always a good place to start. I was actually going to ask you if you had a template of a tag that we should use for something like this. 
Um, does anyone else have any other big questions or big concerns? Feel free to unmic yourself or drop your question in the actual chat box. If no one has any other questions, I have one. Um, when would we be able to take trainings for the food safety compliance? I know some of these guys probably fall under the, the quantity, but it never hurts to actually take some of these trainings, especially since they're only $25 usually. So it ranges. Um, I know Colorado is specifically doing a virtual one on May 9th. It's a full day virtual one. I can give you Charlotte, I can send you that registration link again to send out to everyone. So that way, um, if you're able to make that one, great. If not, that's okay. Um, I can also send you the link um, also in a follow-up email I can send to Charlotte so she can send to all of you. Um, there is a website and it updates, I would say weekly. And I mean, they have virtual trainings going on all year round. So um, you can take it from a different state. You don't have to take it from Colorado. It's the same information that you're going to be getting, but just kind of be aware that it's going to be more covered produce focused and that it might be focused on, if, you know, for example, if you're taking it from Washington, it might look different than if you're taking it from Virginia, just because they grow different crops. So they're trying to, you know, be kind of cognizant of that. But if you're okay with that, that's fine. Um, but otherwise, I mean, yearly, I mean, it. they're going year round. So you can take it whenever you can. Um, and, the, and the price does, does fluctuate per state. Um, ours, it's 25. Um, some states have like non-state. Non so like I know, new, like for example, New Mexico, they have a New Mexico, if you're from New Mexico, price and then if you're from other states it's a different one just because they have to do for shipping costs because you get a huge manual and I can actually show you what it looks like it looks like this you get one of these it's a big thick manual and we ship those out and so you got to cover like shipping costs so that's what the $25 covers um so you get you get one of those and then some states just depending on how they're funded, you can see between $25 and $100. So it's just, if you know, if you want to wait for a cheaper one, that's fine. It's just something that is a requirement and you can take it whenever. I know that was a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> yeah, it's better to have more information than, than not enough. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm going to open up a poll for everyone right now, and let's see if Everybody can actually get hold of it. Just choose one or two of the topics. The question really is which topics on food safety regulations and certification stuff would you like more information on? We're still kind of figuring out what we need to get out to you, how much that you information you need, how many of you actually fall under these rules. So we're also still learning a lot about what we need to do for you. So um, please fill out this poll, let us know. I, I'm still learning. And while this poll is going on, we did have another question fall into the chat box. Just to clarify, as a winery who primarily produce, uh, purchases grapes, do wineries need to register? If you do not grow anything, because I know there are some wineries that grow their own grapes and then also buy other grapes just to make the full, the full volume of what you need. If you are not growing, harvesting, packing, or holding, no, you do not. Um, I would just strongly encourage you just to let us know. So that way, if I'm looking for farms to do some outreach for, and I see that your name is X winery, I'm gonna be reaching out to you to be like, hey, you know, a winery, I'm going to just assume that you, you grow unless you tell me. So um, if you just wanna hedge that and just be like, hey, I'm not a winery, so then I can just take you off my list, but you're not required to but just kind of know that you might be getting a phone call from me to confirm your information 
And if you're okay with that, that's fine. All right, I'm gonna close out this poll and I think it'll show everybody the results, which is actually very helpful for us. Thank you for participating because uh, yeah, timelines for implementation is definitely something that we're still working on. Um, I think Sarah can back me up on that one. It's still a bit of a moving target. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to have a little bit more information as we go forward. I'll, I'll let Sarah answer that one a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. As far as like timelines for implementation, it's going to depend on what you're doing, right? So if you are growing wine grapes, but then also doing, um, you know, peaches or apricots or cherries, I know those are big on the Western Slope. So those are the ones that I'm naming. They're not fully exclusive of just the covered produce, but those are the ones that we kind of see with the wine grapes. You may be inspected more within the next few years than as far as the records if you're commercially exempt. Currently, as it stands, the FDA does not fund us to do record checks because they are still focused on covered farms and exclusively covered farms. And with us, we are still going through initial inspections. Um, we are now down to the very small farms. We're just getting into routine ones. So could in the next few years, could that change? Absolutely. Um, but, uh, but as far as like right now, um, if you're just commercially exempt, probably not within the next couple of years, but I might eat those words maybe next year when they finally decide to give us funding to start checking for these things. But um, we would let you know, like if you register with the program, we send out a, a newsletter every month and then we would be letting you know, like, hey, you need to kind of get your ducks in a row, make sure you have this because we're gonna start checking. So as far as timelines, I would say within, kind of start getting your ducks in a row now. So that way, you don't have to scramble if we reach out and go, oh, we're actually having to do these record checks. So just something to kind of consider. All right. I also have one more poll, and this is going to basically help me figure out what my fall and potentially your fall is going to look like. Um, would you be interested in an in-person for right now in Grand Junction, because that's where most of the vineyards are, uh, produce safety training session. Since right now, most of the availability will be online. And I know a lot of us are, to use a phrase we've all heard a million times, zoomed out. Um, this would give us the chance to do something in person, meet in person. And maybe you actually get to shake Sarah's hand instead of just seeing a face on a screen. So I will admit if we did this, this would be in the fall. The specific time of year will depend heavily on when harvest happens and what the passes look like. Yep, because I've definitely done an in-person one in October over in Grand Junction. And I I drove through every single weather pattern you can imagine. I, I drove through heavy fog and went, oh, this is how I'm starting my four hour trip. That's because I'm on the front range. So I grew up in Westminster, but I now live in Firestone. So I went through heavy, dense fog and then rain and then snow and then rain, snow, and then beauty. And then I hit, I think it was either Frisco or right after it all of a sudden blue skies, sunshine. And I'm like, am I even in the same state? <laughs> That's kind of the way it goes. I've definitely hit this like line. Like once you get past the Eagle, everything starts changing again. It's great. And it does look like quite a few of you would be interested in doing an in-person um, session. That's great, especially since I think it would be a lot more fun. I promise I'll bring donuts and lunch. So I'll, we can actually start talking about this in a couple of months and see what else could actually be of use in our training sessions. So before we wrap things up a little bit early and give you some time back for your day, are there any other big questions that you guys have about produce safety, 
what you need to do. Our goal right now is to kind of dispel some of the concerns about people coming onto your farm and trying to change everything because that's not really our goal or their goal. Um, any other big questions? Any other concerns? Feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute and say them out. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I can give you 30 minutes of your day back. And hopefully we'll see some of you at the virtual training in May. And um, I'll be sending out the video of this in a couple weeks. Thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time. And hopefully you learned a little bit more about uh, the Produce Safety Alliance and what you need to be doing. And uh, if you have any additional questions, please contact Sarah. She's always happy to help. She's already been helping me. So uh, definitely reach out if you have any additional questions. And bye, guys. Have a good day. Sarah, I would like to talk to you for a few seconds right after. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. I had a good time. Uh, I learned because I totally did not realize that there was like one other step to it. So that was nice to hear. Um, I agree. I appreciate it. Good.